Yeah, Mick and uh, Arthur are joining us in studio uh, this week, marking the uh, 10th anniversary of the passing of the great Con Hoolan, which we wanted to uh, mark here on the show because obviously, um, you know, a totem of sports writing in the country and in terms of sports coverage, I think as a whole, before there were radio shows dedicated to sport and TV shows dedicated to sport, we had this man kind of ploughing his own furrow in a way and doing it magnificently and... God, he left a hell of a, a hell of a mark on the sporting landscape just through sheer dint of his of his work. And we thought we'd mark some of that here tonight as well. And Arthur's our, our resident expert on all things con. Experts a stretch. Um, you've got well, you see, you've come uh, equipped with uh, well, with props. <laughs> well, you see, I don't have props with me tonight. This is all just pure ritty. This came today, right? So I met my family earlier on. Um, this afternoon and I wanted to get this book off my dad but he also seemed to have this somewhere in the press oh wow you can help us out there yeah for those of us who aren't streaming this online you'll see it you'll see it that is a glossy colour pullout from the evening press uh, which obviously doesn't exist anymore and it is in the wake of the penalty shootout win over Romania in Genoa so you've got John Byrne in his jersey (laughs) and tracksuit and highlights Uh, you've got Paggy Bonner there you've got Mick Byrne in one of the greatest shell suits of all time the other Mick McCarthy and the other the other Mick McCarthy some might say lesser uh, in there too Jerry Payton in his white top uh, jumping in on, on Packy there oh that's not Jerry Payton I don't think because I'm almost sure I, that image I always have the other grey jersey jumping on top isn't Who's it who's got the highlights then is it uh, not Chris, is it Morris. Chris Morris no? Chris Morris would have been still on the field by that stage the remaining keepers there this is uh, uh, Tuesday July 3rd 1990 it's a little World Cup souvenir. A that is beautifully preserved, by the way. It's a little under a year this, older. Than uh, that. Arthur, can we have this for the studio in our revamp? Oh, that's not for me to say. Okay. You can ask. Arthur O'D Senior is listening. You can ask him. <laughs> He'll hear you. We will have pride of place, like. But you will uh, frame it. Wow. Oh, you like this? This was the reason it was brought in for Con Hoolan. I'll give you the honour there of reading out. Me? Oh, you like this? I know you like the start okay. of this. This well, is like I an episode. I, I, do, like... I do enjoy how this starts. This is uh, this is Con Hoolan <laughs> for me at his best. By so we've just beaten Romania in a penalty shootout. It's uh, or well, I suppose this is after the World Cup. Is this? This is the whole thing. Uh, Treasures for the memory bank is the headline, right? So you're thinking this is going to be a, a beautiful piece full of positivity and glory and. Aren't know. we a fantastic little nation in the, on, at all at all at all? Okay, so I'll start it. The Romans are the greatest snobs in the world, even more so than the people of Paris. And they say that all the people north of the Roman uh, province are Germans and that their uh, fellow countrymen to the south are Africans. It is, of course, an exaggeration, but there is a grain of truth in it. Um, will I go on? Boy, yeah. Well, I, don't, I haven't read this now. Would you uh, stop if you were reading it then? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you're in, you're up. I, I just said, uh, what a way to start an that, article. That's a, that's a first line, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's a first line. This is, I can't believe I'm reading out stuff uh, twice in one, sh- one show, but uh, I felt when I was in Malta and in Sardinia and in Sicily that I was in the world which owed much more to Africa than to Europe. It is hard to explain that feeling. Part of it perhaps was rooted in the cactus and in the giant palm trees and in the harsh light. And part two was in the faces of the people. All, in all three islands, there was a strong Ar- Arabic presence. Malta differs from Sardinia and Sicily in being almost totally free of crime. The weekly court of, uh, in Valletta rarely deals with anything more than cases of drunken disorderliness. Um, I had thought that Sardinia's reputation for kidnapping was part of its dark past, I discovered otherwise. An English teacher who knows the island very well tells me that kidnapping is still very much a part of the economy. The kidnappers are hardly ever brought to justice because of an island, because on the island there is a deep tradition of silence. Look, he goes on about the kidnappers. Um, I, won't, I won't go in it anymore, but like, I mean, this is, this is what Con Hulhan took home from yeah, yeah. the World Cup, you know? And I feel already in a place in the journey around where Ireland played in Italy yeah. in a way that I've never read before in everything I've read about Italian 90. It's not he kicked the ball, he scored the goal. Wasn't it a great performance by everybody? Where's the first mention of actual... I've actually... I'm, I, do you know what? I'm scouring as you ask, right? Yeah. There is... Because if this was released on Twitter, would be like, oh, God, I didn't even talk about the match. You see, I think that's There's partially... There's nothing. An, uh, there's a lot of it to do with as well, like... Uh, a lot of it in hindsight, like, and some of the metaphors... He doesn't talk about football at all. He doesn't need to. <laughs> Why would you? He's talking about the trip to Italy. Like, you know, and that's... Um... Like, the, there's sort of that sort of interesting angle so that he'd take. And I always kind of... It's, I suppose it always comes across between his writing on sport or writing on different literature or art or anything else. He's always obviously an immense knowledge, but it was always kind of what I always really liked, admired about it, was there's really... 
a complete lack of any sort of arrogance. There's no pretense about it. There's no pretense whatsoever. He's 100% sincere about what he's doing and there's no necessarily trying to impress you or impress upon you his knowledge or his, his obviously how well read and cultured and interested he is in the world around him. It's a difficult thing to wear lightly and there's not many yeah. people can kind of pull it off even now. No, and and look, we'll, we'll not name names, but there's a lot of things that you're, I feel one of the, it's a negative thing about his legacy, I suppose, is to a degree some of the, the terrible writing he has spawned. Not from him, not from but him. has spawned from his legacy. Uh, people trying himself, to be yeah. him. He is very, there's something about him that just is immediately, it grips you to try and replicate this where it's it's not easy. The brilliant thing about that that jumps out is that you kind of figure he could, like, there's the scope there and the ability there to be a travel writer. Like yeah. He could have been somebody who did a, who, who did a, a travel journey. Well, but that, tra- but, honest but, travel writer, yeah. as in, you know, you're saying, like, but, I mean, that's not the most complimentary piece. But, I'll, but, I'll actually but in, but in that sense, uh, it, it works better as a sports piece and as an addendum to Ireland's World Cup journey because you're learning more about Ireland's World Cup journey than you would have done that just being a straight travel piece, yeah. if you know what I mean. And similarly, to kind of write about the ephemera and the surroundings of an event is a much harder thing to do well than writing about the nuts and bolts of the thing itself. And I think yeah. that's what he encapsulated in a lot of his work. This is only about, what, 600, 700 words, two-page spread. It's not like, it's, it's not... Uh, most extensive piece of work and that says a lot as well because he crams so much in that's a sign of just an incredible writer as well and we are going to talk about sports stuff a little bit more let me just read one more bit of this because I just read it there while we're talking this is towards the end and what brings well, the reason I want to bring this up is like saying things that are absolutely clearly incorrect and would not be allowed now but it's also kind of harmless and a bit of crack and it's going. you know there's definitely a part that you know this this is taken out of things a little bit, but I also feel like Con Hulhan would have found a way of still being as cutting and as oh, biting. Yeah. But yeah, you know, yeah. so I almost forgot one element which Sardinians and Sicilians and Tuscans and Genoese have in common. Their reverence for money is greater even that even than that of cabin peasants. <laughs> The very way they handle it in the bars and cafes is an indication of how much it means to them. In this world, you will never see money thrown casually onto the counter. And you are reminded that the word bank comes from the Italian word banco, which means bench. The bench was the money lender's counter. Ah, wonderful. Like, just, I don't even know what the point of that was or whether that is even good and whether we're in a better world that that kind of thing isn't written anymore. But at the same time, he wrote beautifully. What I find fascinating is as well, because he had such a distinct, I, know, I never met him, I never, obviously, but he had such a distinct physical presence and look to him. And I suppose that... He looked like he was carved from the land. It, like, it, like it was it was incredibly fitting to how he wrote and, yeah. and his kind of whole, it really was part of the whole persona almost. And it's just the thought of him wandering around in that heat <laughs> like in southern Italy he probably still had the jumper on yeah. yeah and just mixing with these people and obviously taking stuff from them and obviously giving enough that he could take enough back from them in return like it's just there's a fascination I have to that type of thing as well when travelling wasn't I mean travelling was normal enough but even throughout that before that in the like 70s early 80s yeah. Yeah. yeah I just think it was just it's a remarkable sort of indication of obviously just his intuition as well and his ability to to see and pick things up and then translate that in extremely concise language. And there's actually, there's a clip we have here as well. It was taken from this documentary, I think it came out in 2004, um, on RTE, Waiting for Hulan, mm. which I think I, I think refers to the fact, I think it was in the name and Sweeney article, where he talked about the fact of waiting almost for the papers to come with Hulan on it, like it, as it obviously spread out then at different times to different parts of the country. And Noam and Sweeney's from Sligo, so I assume he was talking about it there that you kind of you know he's coming and he'll almost have the final word on the weekends what you've seen and you kind of wait for him it to come and then you understand it and and that kind of whole dynamic. But there's um, I think his name was Tony Mead. I don't want to get that wrong. But there's documentary and Tony Mead was the former deputy deputy editor of the Kerryman. I think it was instrumental in bringing him in there, and he describes Hulahan's writing style. And then at the end of this clip as well, when it's played, you'll hear Hulahan himself talking about the fact that eventually, when he kind of his his talent and everything else became to a point where he kind of had to leave, and he, I, I don't think he left Kerry till he was in his forties, which is kind of in, fascinating as well. He doesn't become a national figure until he's in his forties, and he joins, I think, the Evening Press then at that stage. But you hear him very eloquently talking as well about the last time he 
goes out onto the bog with his father. And um, yeah, if we could play that clip. Con had a, had a very simple style. It, uh, it looked very simple, of course it was deceptively simple. He wrote in very short sentences. I, I looked at it often and I wondered how the hell he did it because I certainly couldn't do it. Uh, most people write long sentences with subordinate clauses and all the rest of it. Con just wrote a simple, clear sentence with no complications. As with everybody who's writing at that pace every week, you know, he was running out of, of material to some extent. It was obvious to me, and even it was obvious to everybody, that he needed to paint on a, on a wider canvas. And we couldn't provide that because he was limited in what he could do for the carryman. And he always wanted to write about sport. And as we all know, he did it so well subsequently. I remember my lesson in the bog with, with special pines. My father and I were working there, there's the two of us, you see. It was in September, and we were putting out the turf, finishing up, you know, basically. And I knew I was going away to a different world, and I knew I'd never work in the bog again. I worked with him again. When it came to say six o'clock, we, we poured the remains of the tea and the water onto the, onto the ashes and quenched the fire. I, I got a tremendous stab in my foot that day. And I always say, in any language, there, there, there are three very sad worlds. But the last time, that, that even to me was if I write for the kind of a, a Bachmark or a Watermark or a Denmark. I was leaving the mountains to went down into the plains. Yeah, that's from waiting for Con back in uh, 2004. Um, just uh, like I say, it's it's difficult to imagine somebody making that breakthrough to the national consciousness um, at that age. Like we were talking about Ian Wright in terms of footballing ability, but to go from being such a local figure and somebody who's very much of his locale to being able to assimilate all of those experiences abroad and all that kind of thing after the age of after the age of 40 it's just it's an incredible thing to not only to do it to vocalise it in words uh, like he has done and it did do throughout an incredible career is, is something else entirely absolutely and, and and the sort of that I always feel that kind of really gets demonstrated across in, in his sort of his humour and his kind of just it's not even witty kind of does it it, it it's not doesn't quite do it justice but just there's a sense of I always it's always kind of quite self-assured I suppose in how he writes and and I think that probably has something to do with it there was never any again we kind of come back to that thing it's like it's never really a sense of trying to impress anyone I presume kind of at that stage you're just like you know what you are you know how you write you know everything else that you're doing and you're trust that you do it well I know we're a little pressed for time but there's one little piece that just sure. demonstrates that humour it's not even thinking it was from an essay about or even an essay or whatever about trains but so that again there's the range but there's an amazing little bit from a collection called In So Many Words um, there are so many stories about the railway and the train that it would make a nice book and it wouldn't be a slim volume I would be content to tell just the one the hero was a man called Morris Keane. He lived in a bog about a mile from our town. He wasn't overburdened with education, but he was famous for his sense of humour and his wit. A time came when he had to go to Dublin. It was so long ago that what is now Port Leash was then known as Maryborough. He positioned himself at the ticket window. He was the last in a queue of four. He decided to take his cue from the girl in front of him. She said, Maryborough, third, single. He said, Morris Keane, fourth, married. <laughs> short <laughs> sentences all short yeah, you know incredibly. like that that's a, it's, it's a very specific writing style you know I know we don't have uh, time to get to it now you're going to play a clip of you know the describing the famous piece of uh, the famous piece of writing after Mikey Shee's goal in sure. the 1978 final where he chipped Paddy Cullen and it was like what was it like a woman who realised that the, her oven was uh, burning yeah. or you know something like that but the, the thing I always find with that is, is if you actually read that piece, what is, while there is beautiful little analogies and whatever you want to call them, like that buns burning in the oven, his description of what is happening, outside of that even, describes that goal, you can see it in your head, We've all, we all know what that goal looks like, but his description of it is so perfect. And it's funny, like that's when match reports in the written form or radio is at its very, very best. And it's a lost art in some ways because it doesn't need to be done anymore. We don't really need to fully describe to you what 
an amazing goal Shamrock Rovers scored tonight in the detail that might have been done by Michal O'Hare mm. because we know that everybody's going to be able to see it within seconds, <laughs> you know? And it's like, not, not, not that we shouldn't do it, but, yeah. you know, it's a lost art in some ways, but Conor Hula had an amazing, amazing ability to tell you back in the day when all you had was possibly the radio commentary and if you missed that, the newspaper report the next day was the only way you knew what happened in these games. He had an amazing way of telling, just to, to kind of like, you know, what you're saying there is, a, a, what you read out there is a beautiful story, but he was a brilliant sports reporter, yeah. you know, and had, had an incredible way about that. The other thing that, lastly on that, is that the respect that he had from, you know, waiting, you know what you're saying, waiting for Khan, like the respect that he had from his, um, his, like, his peers was, I think, second to none. Every story you hear, like, there's stories There's that like, I wonder that are some of them are, like, even hypocritical, but, like, it's, like, anything that was possibly out of Khan's mouth is the defining word in anything. We're reading his Italian 90 <laughs> report there. Like, the, one of the most famous lines from, that I ever hear from Khan Houlihan was, like, and everybody will bring it up, like, whenever we're, like, Declan Lynch is talking, writing a book about Italian 90, and there's all, the, the line always comes as Khan Houlihan says, he missed all the crack of Italian 90 because he was in Italy, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah. it's the word of Khan is the word of God almost, you know what I mean? That's like, so I don't know if anybody in the Irish, in Irish media even, sport or otherwise, has ever had that kind of reverence. It'd be hard to match it again. Oh, it'll never you're not, happen again. Like you're not, you're never going to, you're never going to have, have that focal point that, it'll never that he offered. Again. No, yeah. never. Um, Worth investigating the name of the book again, Arthur. Oh, that's one just one of many. That's in so many words. The mm -hmm. best of Con Hulan. Yeah, track there are it. a few. There are a few yeah. knocking around. Track them down where and, and when you can.